This morning, we're going to be talking about ambitious moves in the, for a commercial in Sydney, get trumped, and what we mean by that. Just connecting Mark so I can hear him. Okay, Mr. Novak, how are you? Good, you? Great. I can hear you. I can see you. We're good to go. We're good to go. I'm, I'm coming to you from Brisbane. Beautiful. Beautiful. How is it up there? Mate, what a place. What yeah. a place. It's got, it's got everything. You. It's just, yeah, incredible. I, um, I've been here for a very long time and uh, absolutely blown away. Absolutely blown away. Good place is to go. It? Well, we do, when we do the Arik conference, we do all enjoy it up there. It is quite a nice little world um, and pretty attractive pricing price points as well. I think a lot of people are saying, should I buy Brisbane Gold Coast? So but that's another topic. I think we could do that one tomorrow, actually. Big time. Um, all righty. Ambitious commercial moves in Sydney get trumped. Um, where this sort of, just to give out a bit of background, where this um, this topic came from was Glenn Hicks, the um, grandfather in the office, where we sort of said, uh, we made the comment that if you look at Sydney or Australia compared to America, about really, um, America's really pro entrepreneurs. Give it a crack. If it doesn't go ahead, you... If it doesn't go ahead, you go bankrupt and you can try again. And what we mean by that, if you're looking at the Australian bankruptcy policies and the American, in short, my, my understanding is pretty, it's basically in Australia, if you go bankrupt, you're pretty much, pretty much screwed for seven years. You can't really get a phone bill. You can't do anything. They really penalise you. And um, compared to America where they're like, have a crack. If it doesn't work, you go bankrupt and try again in a nutshell. Is that sort of your understanding as well, Mark? Did I simplify it too much? Yeah, look, I, I think we're, we're not coming, certainly not coming from a legal, just just from an outside in, hey, Michael, do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, we oh, don't, I don't really sort of know intricately what it means, but I, I think you're absolutely right. And, you know, it, it's something that it, it seems like if you have a hack uh, in the States and you fail, you know, it's, um, it's not as, you don't get nailed as hard as you do uh, in Australia. Um, and it seems like it, you know, that, and I guess that's creativeness that you sort of, yeah. um, you get rewarded, um, or you don't get punished as hard for, you know, for, for having a go and getting creative. Or and shame. Stuff and but even like people's ethos around it, where I think, it, um, if you said you went bankrupt in Australia, they'd be like, oh, you suck. Sort of like it's, um, a bit frowned upon. It's never good, but I think in, um, America, it's a bit like you had a crack. It's, I don't think you get shamed as much or the feeling, or at least that's what I've been told. Or I think um, that's sort of where yeah, we're going Yeah, big time. There. And, um, and, and I think it, even, and when you can... <laughs> Vel, how are you, legend? Um, but I think, yeah, Boy, definitely. Like yours, um, yeah, sorry, and in, in a, but we're in Australia, or, or I think you sort of... And where, where this was coming from is when we were, we were having a chat about um, commercial businesses and starting your business. Um, it's a much risky move because um, you, your body's on a line much harder than it is, um, for example, in a country like that. So if you fa if you fail and go into um, that sort of bankruptcy sort of um, thing that you, you just get nailed so much hard harder, but in Australia, but in America, you can sort of you can uh, reinvent yourself pretty quickly. Um, yeah. But, you know, it must be really hard for people starting businesses here when you're looking up the wall of that concept, eh? 100%. So, and, and this is where we bring it back to say, Sydney, and what, what we mean by that on the ground is like, we're doing, we're doing, to give it a um, back, like we've, in DY, we've done about 70 to 80% of the lease and sales deals um, for the last 12 months and got a great market share across the Northern beaches. So, we're set, we meet a lot of business owners and we're, we're, we got a lot under management and we're always obviously looking at where they are and saying, hey, why don't you expand here? Why don't you do this? And we're always getting like this, not pushback, like even if they're great oper operators, very successful, but they're just very, very, um, not scared's not the word, but they're very cautious because it's not like, yes, they've got a booming business under this company, but if, it, if they try and do something and be ambitious and embrace their creativeness and just give it a crack, if it doesn't work, 
they're thinking they're losing their house, they're losing um, any savings because I, th I think that the penalty, it just fucking chases you through your life where in other countries, it's sort of like if that business doesn't go well, they just stop there. They're not, they're not basically taking everything you've got. Um, so we see that. Even with property, where, Michael. Yeah. You know, with property, you know, like when in property, people just returning keys, the GFC back to their banks in America, they're just walking in, throwing the keys on the counter and walking back out. Um, that was the difference in Australia. Um, people didn't have that ability. People were um, screwed, you know, and they were screwed for um, a good part of their, of their working life. Whereas in America, you just walk back in and throw the keys on the table with a mortgage. The, the security that they, they took was much smaller than what they took in Australia. Yeah. And that's sort of that balance between chaos and order. Like you've got, and um, what we mean by that is like, you've got the the entrepreneurs out there who are just, they're just sort of like going, you said it perfectly yesterday, Mark, when we were speaking about it, the chaos, the order, where, do you want to explain on that? You said it really well. Um, it look, you know, it, it's, China it's one of those things America where- and ambition, and, yeah. Yeah, so with 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 a lot of countries, when there's creativity, um, there's uh, there's chaos. Um, so you know, chaos and creativity, beautiful ideas, and to give you an idea, what you know, what what some of those things are, you know, music, art, um, new concepts. Um, you know, like we, if you look at for America, for instance, you know, companies like Tesla, you know, the craziness. Um, but out of that comes fantastic things. Um, but then you look at uh, order, which is um, like communist countries. And for instance, if you look at um, someone like China, order, what pumps out with order is productivity. So to have a really good balance of chaos and order um, is a pretty good country. So America does tend to have a pretty cool balance of that, whereas they can come up with the great enough ideas and concepts and craziness uh, with their creativity, but then they can also um, they can also ramp it out in, in, in a production-like fashion and, and have order behind that. That's so no good having a great idea if it doesn't get executed. So China is probably on a little bit on the other end of the scale where they can't really create like the Americans can, but they can certainly um, ramp out and like in a production line, a shitload of stuff very, very quickly. So um, when you look at chaos and order, if you're a country with a good blend uh, or if you're a person with a good blend of chaos and order, you're smart enough to come up with a cracker idea um, and then what happens is you um, you can execute it because you've got the order behind you. So we really need both. And this morning's discussion is really about, um, you know, let's uh, we're probably getting a little bit too much order in Australia and we yep. probably need a little bit of, bit of chaos, a bit of creativity in Australia to have a crack at these new businesses. Well, this actually reminds me of something. It was the first time I met Steve Carroll. It was a, it was some sort of seminar four or five years ago, and it just clicked to me then. Um, where a straight, when you look at the top biggest companies of the country, which goes with what you're saying, chaos and order, so and, and producing and creativeness. So Australia, the top companies were like banks and mining. So mining's just really production line produce. Um, just, just same old thing, repetitiveness. Order. Where, order, just bang, 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 do it really well, do it hard, like China. Where, but America, their top companies were created like techs, startups, well, not startups if they're the top, but all Apple. creativeness, all um, people who just went out and created something and went on a limb and started a business. Like our, our top, in our top 10, we had, a bank. There was not a bank in the top of America. If well, they did go into their GFC, but and there was no mining. It was all like your Apples, your IBM, your Amazon. Just these Tesla. people who Tesla yeah. went basically started in a garage and created something. And when you're creating and it hasn't been done before, it's cha it's chaotic. It, there's no there's no menu. There's no recipe. It's not like making a burger where it's like there's your five steps. So I think that's where we we're trying to relate it to the chaos of the order. Bill wants to know if you're in Serbia. No, what to say? Bring back real estate, guy. Bring me back to real estate. 
Um, well, I think one of the one of the Bell works for one of the greatest companies in Australia. Yeah, hundred you know, percent. Buttercup, you know, or yep. Tip Top. I think it's Tip Top. Then and or, <laughs> and then I think there's where and also an example where if the um to sort of encourage a bit more of that creativeness to Australia because we're seeing I think we're seeing we are seeing and we always talk about Mark some great opportunities in that sort of food industry um, with you've got the chaos of like your Deliveroo, which is disrupt, um, which is disrupting the, the market. But then we need those entrepreneurs or well, the people that are doing it really well are going, well, why do I need a retail shop on the beach to produce this product when I can get a, a ghost kitchen in Brookvale? Um, I think we've spoken to a lot of people about it. Everyone sort of loves it, but a lot of people are hesitant because of the actual penalty of doing it. So whenever the environment is that everyone believes is a great idea, but they're too fearful of losing everything, I think there needs to be that balance, what you said, where there's enough of a rope for people to go out there and and try, uh, try and be creative, but not um, and, but also be not too fearful that they're going to lose everything to do it as well. So I think um, you had some good examples, Fishbowl, Wings and Tins, Gomez, Real and I, great new micro businesses um, that are popping up everywhere. Yeah, and I think a lot of these, a lot of these guys are building their business on the back of what's changed. Um, on they're modelling themselves to consumers' needs, and the consumers' need to, to whoa, look at that, uh, consumer. <laughs> I, 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 was, yeah, I was putting, but I thought put one camera in front. I was like, why am I going that way? And then I no, realised the camera there. Um, consumers, yeah. consumers' needs have changed so much. Um, and I think some of these businesses have been so agile to meet the consumer's needs very quickly. And that's also been risky for them. You know, mm. so they, they've taken that risk to meet the consumer's needs and they did, didn't, you know, and, and that's, that's been a ballsy thing to do. So, you know, when, um, you know, not only does technology change, but food changes. Um, you look yeah. at one of these great businesses, fish bowls, these, these pokey bowls weren't around um, five, 10, 15 years ago like they were now on scale someone's taken the concept and actually no one's ever done it it's a big risk it's a huge risk you because you've got to retrain consumers on eating a new food it's not it's like here's another burger joint oh, i know what a burger is yeah. um it's like okay, you know you, this is called fishbowl let me tell you what it is let me tell you how to make it let me tell you how to eat it uh it comes out of a bowl ba 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 there's there's different things like that which is really really interesting mm. um but I, I think that, you know, I just this morning's more about encouraging people to to have a go, uh, adopting change, um, yep. not punishing people for having a go as hard as um, uh, some other countries, for instance. Um, I, I think when we used America as an example, but um, we can also use China as an example, that's a place that to have a go, you've got to have super big balls. Um, mm. you know, so when you look at that on the other side of the pendulum, that's, that's a big risky move. We're not like that. Um, but we are getting regulated. That's for sure. We, and we've Definitely. got to really just encourage, we've got to loosen the belt. Like, look what happened with the lockout laws. Yeah. It goes one. Yeah. It goes too far. But I've always thought too far. Reckon... You, yeah. <laughs> always... Without realizing just such a little move just cripples an entire economy. Um, you know, um, sector of our business and night economy um just by making such a simple move so if we can make good simple moves little moves in the positive direction uh, mm. for business that's huge uh, and i think yeah. tying back to commercial which is what what we do in property you know in northern beaches i think um with council the way councils and government can underpin and support these businesses is you know operating hours um yes, yes is uh, allowances with with as with um when when applications are made i know michael you were saying that there's been some unbelievable compliance that's been needed on you you've successfully oh. let some cracker properties lately and they've just come undone because of compliance yeah so we've had about three or four deals brand new properties um where great it just it, the tenants were happy buyers uh, the buyer was happy um, there and due to, a lot of it was due to the cladding and the the fire regs, 
basically the fit out costs had almost tripled due to new regulations. I know one deal in particular, new regs were coming through and they hadn't even decided what they were actually, what you could do. So this owner couldn't build because they wouldn't get the, because they couldn't start building because they hadn't actually said what they actually have to use to build. Um, but then you can't just sit and wait for a deal to come through and when, and we were fortunate enough that we were able to, well, not fortunate, but the there was still time. And by the time they found out what the cost would be from the suppliers, because the suppliers were like, we don't even have that product to build with the new regs. The fit out basically like tripled and it just, it ruined about three, four deals um, on properties that needed to be let for the area, for the new buildings coming through. So I, I think um, we've got to be mindful of that as well. Like, especially when it comes to fit outs where you've, there's so much compliance a developer for the actual building has to do. And when you're talking about a 30, 40 square meter shop and just to meet requirements, you're talking about a couple hundred grand fit out just to really do a, a warm shell. Um, it's a little bit ridiculous. And then also, I think one thing um, to encourage the business would be the turnaround time through council to get approvals um, because you've got to adapt. Owners have empty shops. They don't want to have it sitting like tenants can't commit to a deal without knowing they're going to get approved because they, it's like a phone, it's like going into a phone contract, not knowing if you're going to have a phone, basically. You want to know that you've got the lease, but then you can operate your, your business out of there. And sometimes the turnaround time can be so long that tenants can't commit, owners can't commit and deals don't happen. And the end result is that local area has an empty shop. We all, everyone drives, there's not, there's nothing worse than driving through um, a suburb and just seeing empty shop, empty shop, empty shop. A lot of the time people think it's a greedy landlord, a lot of, but a lot of the time it's not. Hey Mark, like we're seeing landlords um, become at the moment being very, very negotiable. And a lot of deals are more falling through because of um, compliance, build costs, trades. Wow, I, I don't think it's been harder. Um, in this time to get trades and get some sufficient information for people to build. So I think um, as an agent, you've definitely got to gear up your team for your prospective tenants uh, to get some build costs and timing because we're seeing a lot of deals fall through that way as well. Yeah. Look, I think compliance is a big one and, and you got to, uh, it's, it, it can kill an economy. It can kill a suburb very, very softly um very very quickly um you know uh, so i think that we've got to really be mindful of that hey really got to, and we've got to really we've got to really support local business and support these new businesses that are coming in on the ground as best as we can on a compliance level on a customer base um pat on the back uh financially yeah. banks and stuff like that as much as possible because these are the guys that are going to um, that are going to flourish in our in our local area in our local economy. So um, uh, again, going back to commercial real estate and having a hack and start and starting your business, um, you you got to be super smart. And um, and I think I think everyone around you's got to you've got to have yeah. that you got to have that support via council, um, yeah. compliance, lending, and your customer base. So it's huge. And also one thing, look, seeing the probably. Uh, seeing the corner before it happens. Like there's a lot of old regulations based on requirements for businesses, based on how businesses operated five, 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago, i.e. restaurants with how many, like if you have a certain type of business, um, how many car spaces you need and uh, they've got ratios. Now I would, I would say it now businesses are changing. Food industry is changing. So I think we may start coming across um, where council regs don't match the businesses anymore, where they're there. Yeah, that's a really good point, that one. That's a yeah, really, really I just thought point. about it then. You know, going if you if you look at how many people are pulling up to a restaurant for a meal in their in their vehicle, uh, wanting to park on the curb side, um, that is uh, a real Really, a thing of the past. Our patronage to restaurants has definitely really, yeah. really changed. So, where, where this matters if for people that are watching, um, we have developers that were building, and they would build a shop of fifty meters squared 
I'm not going to give you an exact example because I don't know one off the top of my head. You can help me out if you've got one, Michael. Yeah. But a 50 metre squared shop in some circumstances needed five or 10 car spaces. Yeah, with some usages, especially when it comes to with some usages. But I think it where on that one, it would be like you're doing the food and you only do delivery, let's say, and you've got no staff. But council say you need 10 car spaces. And like, but that's not our business. We don't need it. And you can get around it with traffic engineering, but the head, <laughs> the, no one's the climate, do that. no one's going to do it. And the money a tenant has to spend um, to get around something like that, it, it's, it just doesn't happen. So I think um, I'm saying it now. I think councils say they're going to have to, with businesses changing, how consumers purchase and how they shop is changing. So I also requirements for parking, seating, outdoor area, that will also start to change. I haven't seen it yet affected. Well, per, like, but I think it will. Now I thought about it. I've called it here. And also um, that <laughs> also then goes back to toilets as well. Yes. Yeah. A you lot know, of times. They were, they were out of control in some small shops. They were saying, look, you got to have, you know, four toilets. And that's, yeah. you know, that that's pretty almost it's impossible to do for most for most commercial spaces yeah and it's like people are just picking up a coffee why do they need four toilets and go to the bathroom at home sort of thing like or there's a lot of uh things like that as well so anything i think we've gone on for a while i think <laughs> it's a big one yeah um anything else you want to add there mark oh good bud have a great All day good. Have a good time in Goldie and... Um, we'll the reason I got my hairy chest out is I'm in Brisbane. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Perfect. All righty, guys. Tune in. Thanks for tuning in. Lisa, Amal, Chris, Will, Vel, Jeff. Always a pleasure. Any questions, uh, just DM us and we'll answer them. No problems. Thank you. All right, guys. Cheers. Cheers. Bye. Thank you.